45. Now you remember that Joseph in chapter 44 was confronting his brothers and had made a heavy demand on them. Judah, one of his brothers, had responded by saying that he would serve as a as an offering, in a sense, as a ransom to allow Judah's father to continue to live because Joseph had made a demand that, well, Judah and the rest of the brothers knew would destroy their father. So what Judah said, and I'll turn to it, Judah said in uh, chapter 44, verse 30, in reference to the fact that Joseph has demanded Benjamin, his brother, now therefore when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad isn't with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, if I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Now, therefore, please, let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me, lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father? Joseph has demanded Benjamin, and Judah has said, I will be a ransom for Benjamin. And you know that Jesus Christ comes from the tribe of Judah, and this is a perfect picture of the sacrifice Jesus himself made as a substitute offering. And that's the portrayal here. And you see the character of, of being an offering on behalf of somebody else as Judah responds in this way. Now, this is the most dramatic moment in, uh, in, uh, in probably in the, in the Genesis account because 22 years have passed See, Joseph was 17 years old when he was sold into slavery. 22 years have passed. His brothers have thought him dead for 22 years. They think he's dead right now. They think they're speaking to an Egyptian because Joseph has been speaking through an interpreter all this time. They think that Joseph, a man of such power, is an Egyptian. And Joseph all along has been for the last couple of years dealing with his brothers, and they don't even know it. And so Joseph can't restrain himself any longer. In verse 1 of chapter 45, Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. Man, he must have been really crying loudly for these people to hear it. Because later on, you know, they're out of the room. They're not anywhere near it. And they can hear him just crying his eyes out. And he's wailing. I don't know um, how often a human being uh, does this, but there are times of intense sorrow that your tears well up inside of you and you cry. And your cry can be very loud. It's a wail even. It's an agony. Well, this was a different kind of cry. It wasn't a, an agony. It was... It was, it was all those years that had been inside of him that were coming out. And he was going to reveal himself now to his brothers. And he's crying loudly. And the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. I'm Joseph. You know, <laughs> They must have, well, they fried. They didn't know what to do with that. I'm Joseph. Does my father still live? His brothers couldn't answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. That word literally means they were terrified. It was like they'd seen a ghost. It's like, wait a minute, man, for 22 years I've been carrying this grief. Now, as we've been going through Genesis, the Genesis account of the brothers selling Joseph into slavery, you see them bantering amongst themselves constantly about the guilt they've been harboring for all these years. Years of guilt. Years of guilt. You know, when something happens in their life, they say, it's God, it's God. You know, he's repaying us for the evil that we've done when we sold our brother Joseph off into slavery. And the guilt has been embedded in their heart for 22 years. They thought him dead. 
So they're talking to this guy. The guy looks identical to any of the Egyptians. He's a man of great power, honor, and dignity. And he looks at them and he speaks to them and he says, I'm Joseph. How's my dad doing? They, they, they didn't know how to relate to that. They got scared. They got terrified. It was like a ghost was standing in front of them. And the fear overcame them because this is a, Joseph's dead as far as they were concerned. And Joseph's there telling him that he's not. Now, they're also afraid that he's going to wreak vengeance on them. As a matter of fact, we'll see this at the end of the chapter. They, they make up a lie because they're still afraid that Joseph's going to get back at them because of what they did to him. So they're terrified at him because he's supposed to be dead. Now he's alive. And now what's he going to do to us? So they're terrified in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. And they came near and he said, I'm Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years, the famine has been in the land and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hasten and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not tarry or delay. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near to me, you and your children, your children's children, your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty, for there are still five years of famine. And behold your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. In other words, I'm not speaking through an interpreter. I want you to notice something, though. I want you to see something. This is important for us as Christians to learn. And it's very important for us to learn this. And it's something that God will take our entire life to teach us, our entire lifetime to teach us. Most of the time when something occurs in my life that seems to be negative, I immediately, I get, I get depressed. I get upset. I get nervous. If I were Joseph sold off into slavery the way he was, I don't know what kind of attitude I'd have in life. He got a raw deal. He got a raw deal. He was innocent. Not only was he put into the household of Potiphar and served there, but he was put into prison. And, you know, he hasn't seen his dad. He hasn't seen his, his brother, Benjamin, since he was just a little guy. And his brothers treated him like, well, like he was useless. They were so callous and cold. They threw him down this dry well, sat down, ate lunch, sold him off into slavery. But look at his attitude. He's saying, man, all these things that were apparently negative were really the hand of God working in my life. That's how we see trials. The apparent negatives are God working in your life very often. And that's what he saw. And you'll see this later on more clearly, but he points that out. He said, it wasn't you. It wasn't you who sold me off. It was God preparing me to deliver you. And it didn't appear that way at first, I'm certain. But this is how it has unfolded in time. So the guys can't believe who they're talking to. And he says, so notice, he says, I'm speaking to you with my own mouth. I don't need an interpreter. I speak Hebrew. I'm speaking your language. He says, so, so you shall tell my father and all my, of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you've seen, and you shall hasten and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And the reason he wept is because when he fell on his brother's neck, he broke it. No. <laughs> you know, every time I read that, I wonder, what does that mean? You know, it, it, sometimes when you take the scriptures literally, you could really have a little problem with that one. But literally, all that means naturally is that he grabbed hold of Benjamin, and Benjamin grabbed hold of him, and they wept on each other, and they cried. And it was his little brother, and his little brother was wondering, why is this guy so concerned for me? Why is he caring for me like, like Joseph was? Joseph was showing him a lot of favor. And so Benjamin finally realizes, this is my big brother, you know. This is the big brother I lost when I was probably around three years of age, because that's around how old Benjamin was when he lost his big brother. Benjamin was about three years old. 
And now he sees his brother again. And Benjamin at this time is probably about 25. Joseph's 39 years old. And they kissed. In verse 15 it says, He kissed all his brothers and wept over them, and after that his brothers talked with him. That's the heart of tenderness. That's the heart of Joseph. Somebody who didn't hold something against them but forgave freely because he saw God's hand in it. Now the report of it was heard in Pharaoh's house saying, Joseph's brothers have come. So it pleased Joseph and his servants well. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, do this. Load your beasts and depart. Go to the land of Canaan. Bring your father and your households and come to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you will eat the fat of the land. In other words, you're going to take the best. Now you are commanded, do this. Take carts out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives. Bring your father and come. Do not be concerned about your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Then the sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them carts according to the command of Pharaoh, and he gave them provisions for the journey. He gave to all of them, to each man, changes of garments. But to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. And that, once again, just shows that the favoritism that he has for his own flesh is because uh, Benjamin, being his 100%, his brother, he had favoritism for his little brother. And he gave him, not only did he give him five changes of garments, but he also gave him a considerable amount of money. And he sent his, to his father these things, ten donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt and ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and food for his father for the journey. So he sent his brothers away, and they departed. And he said to them, See that you do not become troubled along the way. In other words, now this is important for us too to learn. Don't let your conscience tear you apart now. You've received forgiveness. One of the things that Christians fail very often to realize is that their conscience has been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. This is important for us to learn. And it's something many Christians don't understand. You see, what we do is we want to go into our past and make up for all the sins that we've done somehow, one by one, and we can't do that, so we're frustrated. So we live lives of legalism where we try and prove to God that we love Him by doing heavy and hard things for Him. We get frustrated because the burden's too great. And we fail to realize that God has saved us by His grace. Now, I was speaking to somebody recently who told me that he, he knew that we're saved by faith, he said. I know that we're saved by faith. He said, and so I'm always trying to drum up faith. And I said, that's not what the scriptures teach, brother. I said, the Bible teaches you are saved by grace. It's God's grace. And all it requires is an answer of even a little bit of faith to be saved. It's God's grace that saved you. And God utilizes the medium of your faith in response to it. But you can't drum up faith to be saved. You respond to the grace that God has given to you. And then your conscience is cleansed. Your heart is purified, and you're given the power to live a life that's godly. And so what he's doing here is he's telling his brothers, now, this is heavy, man. 22 years you've been harboring guilt. I'm telling you, you're completely forgiven. And on the way, don't get troubled about it. I have forgiven you. Most of us don't believe that, though. When God says you're totally forgiven, we still try and prove to God we love him. Well, in this sense here, the brothers you're going to see are going to continue in the guilt. They're going to continue harboring that. They, they can't acknowledge that they've been freely forgiven, even almost to the end. Then they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob, their father, and they told him, saying, now this must have been difficult, because you remember that 22 years ago they brought his coat of many colors, and they had torn it up, and they had bloodied it up, and they had lied to their father. And for 22 years, their dad has been sorrowing. He said, I'm going to go to my grave with a broken heart over my son, Joseph. I'll never be comforted. And for 22 years, he's been harboring this tremendous pain. My son's dead. My son's dead. So now they're going to have to come up and confess to him, no, Joseph's not dead, but he's really the governor of Egypt. And so the father's going to respond like anyone would. They said to him, Joseph's still alive. He's the governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart stood still because he didn't believe him. He said, there's no way I can believe that. 
Now when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. In other words, joy just overflowed. He was like a man born again. He said, man, it's true. He, says, he goes out and he sees all this food and all this goods, and, and, and he sees all the, the money that Benjamin has, all the clothing, and he just, boy, he's just excited. So Israel says, it's enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go to see him before I die. And that is most incredible. I'm certain that was the best news he'd ever heard, that his son was still alive. So Israel, Jacob's covenant name with God, so Israel took his journey with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. Then God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night. Now this is the eighth time God has spoken to him through visions, and this is the last time. And he said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. And he said, I'm God, the God of your father, do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again, and Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. Now, I want you to notice how God speaks. This is just an interesting sidelight to me. You know, I think God, when God spoke to, to Jacob or anybody that he verbally spoke to, I believe God's voice is a very normal voice. I don't believe that the clouds parted and suddenly, you know, a uh, tremendously bass voice came out, you know, speaking King James. You know, I believe that what he did is he spoke to him, just spoke to him. And when God speaks to you, you know God's voice. And there are times, I'm certain, there are people who give testimony that they've heard the voice of the Lord. And I believe that God speaks very normally. As a matter of fact, I know he does. You know, I never base my teachings on experience, but experience should be always brought into line with Scripture. There was one time that I'm definitely sure that I heard the voice of the Lord, though. I know I've heard the voice of God on two occasions, specifically. One time I was going to bed. Uh, I had been weeping that night because we'd been kicked out of a church that we were meeting in, and we didn't have any place to go. And I remember I was weeping on the floor. It was a Wednesday night, and I went to teach the Bible study, and one of my friends saw that I was, I looked like death warmed over. I just looked terrible. And they knew that something was wrong, but they didn't know exactly what it was, and so they prayed for me at the Bible study. And I went home that night thinking, Lord, we're getting kicked out of this building. We have 60 people that I'm very concerned with because we don't have any place to, to meet uh, within the month. Within two weeks, actually, we're going to be kicked out. <laughs> And, uh, and I was praying, and I told the Lord, and he brought peace to me. And as I was climbing to bed that night, very specifically, I can remember a voice speaking to me, and it was not outside, it was inside, and it said, it was a voice, and I believe it was the Lord, and he said, you're going to need a place to uh, sit 200 people come Easter Sunday. And it was just that, that kind of normal voice, and I said, well, that's true. Now, that was a ridiculous thing for me. I never made that up myself because we only had 60 people in the church. Why would we need a place to sit 200? By the way, we're being kicked out of this building. We don't have any place anyway. And, but it was such a normal voice, and I'll never forget that. And come Easter Sunday, it was true. We had a place, and we had a couple hundred people sitting there. And it happened like that again in a different time where the voice of the Lord, I was laying down on a couch, and I was studying for a Sunday morning. And I had uh, written a letter to Calvary Chapel, close to Mesa. I'd written it to Chuck Smith. I said, Lord, uh, I'd like to be part of, of the Calvary Chapel ministry. So I wrote a letter to Chuck. A couple of weeks had passed, and I was laying down on the couch, and I was studying the Word, and I was going to be preaching out of John's Gospel. And there was a passage there that said, Unless a grain of wheat uh, fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it will bring forth much fruit. And at that time, I was praying, and I said, You know, Lord, I said, I believe that I've died. I have died. At this time, I can sense that within myself, I've died to you. And, and at that time, a male, the mailman walked up, and the voice of the Lord once again spoke, and he said, the letter from Chuck is here. Actually, he said, your letter is here. And I said, yeah, I know. And I walked out, picked up, and there it was. There was a stack of mail, and it was a letter from Costa Mesa. And in that letter, it said, we would like to welcome you into the Calvary Chapel Fellowship. And so I do believe that God speaks to you, and I, do, I don't discount that, whether he does or doesn't, but I know that God doesn't open the ceiling and scream at you with a megaphone. He speaks very normally, very calmly, and it is certainly God. And that's how he was dealing here with his servant, Jacob. He said, I'm God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, 
for I will make you, I will make of you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. Literally, what that means is Joseph will close your eyes as you die, when you die. Then Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob, their little ones and their wives, in the carts which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. So they took their livestock and their goods, and they, uh, which they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and went to Egypt, Jacob and all his descendants with him. His sons and his sons' sons, his daughters, his sons' daughters, and all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. Now from verses 8 following to about verse 27, you find the names of uh, the sons and, and the children, but I'm not going to read all those names to you. Uh, some of those names are really, really crack up, though, you know, and, and when you read them, they bust you up. Like, how would you like to be named in verse 21, Muppim or Huppim? You know, they, they appear to be twins, you know, Muppin and Huppin. I'm not sure, <laughs> but that's kind of a radical name. I don't think I could shackle a child with that name. You know, Muppin Rosales just doesn't make it. I think they, they were the original Muppets, but I'm not sure. Muppin and Huppin and Ard. That's, those are nice names, Ard. So as you go through these names, you might find them hilarious, actually. And, uh, basically, if you want to read them on your own, feel free to do that. I'm going to read in verse 26, though. It says, All the persons who went with Jacob to Egypt, who came from his body, besides Jacob's son's wives, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph, who were born to him in Egypt, were two persons. All the persons in the house of Jacob, who went to Egypt, were 70. So what that means is 66 went with him. Three of them were already there and including himself adds up to 70 people, 70 from his loins. It doesn't include his servants. It doesn't include his daughters-in-laws and sons-in-laws. It's just in direct reference to his descendants, and that's the number 70. 70 went. Then he sent Judah before him to Joseph to point out before him the way to Goshen, and they came to the land of Goshen. Now, I want to do some spiritualizing here very quickly. Goshen is the promised land that has been promised, in a sense, to Jacob. It is the land of plenty in Egypt. It's the best land Egypt has. As a matter of fact, Pharaoh offered him the best, and Goshen was the land that was the best. You're going to see this in a minute, but I want you to notice that they're coming out of a famine. They've been in hard times for two years, and for five more years, the land of Canaan and Egypt is going to be decimated by famine. But God has provided for them a land that is flowing with grain, a land that is going to support them, a land that they're going to be able to come to and they're going to have pleasure and they're not going to experience famine. They're going to experience plenty. It's a land that they called Goshen. But I want you to notice who went before in order to go and have that Goshen experience prepared. It was Judah. Do you know, do you remember Judah's name, what that means? It means praise. I believe that praise prepares the way to experiencing the deeper things of God. I'm going to spiritualize this, but you're going to see this throughout the scriptures. Judah will go before, and you'll see this as we go through the Old Testament, Judah will go before the rest of the tribes in battle. They'll say, who should go first? Who should go before us? They inquired of the Lord. God will say, send Judah before him. Judah is praise. Praise before the battle. Praise before the victory. Praise before entering the promises of God. This is the reason why the people of God need to learn to praise and offer the fruit of their lips, which is the sacrifice of praise to God. This is why God says in his word that we're to be thankful, because thankfulness and praise give us the opportunity to enter, in, to enter into the promises and to the blessings. And we need to understand that. Now, you don't rejoice for the trial, but you rejoice through the trial. Why? Because you know that the fruit of that trial is going to be patience. The fruit of that trial is going to be endurance. It's going to be the character of God. It's going to be the hope, the understanding that God works in your life. Praise. Praise is the hidden factor of victory. And we can quote Scripture all you want. But until you begin to offer God praise, until you begin to say, I love you, Lord. I don't care what the circumstances look like. Boy, I just love you, Lord. 
When you learn to praise God, watch how he blesses you. It's the truth. It's something we need to learn. We're so caught up in our circumstances that very often we forget that God wants just to give us the victory. But we see the circumstance. We see the hurt. We see the pain. We see the rejection. We see all the trial. God says, praise me. If you praise me, you'll enter into promises. Oh, you'll enter into anyway, but you'll enter in probably disgruntled, unhappy, maybe a sourpuss. You'll make it in. You know, the Bible says that some of us will make it in, you know, uh, but just by the, by the, the skin of our teeth. I mean, we'll, we'll make it when our, our clothes are still smoking from the fire, you know. <laughs> some of us will make it in that way. So there are differences of ways to enter into the promises of God, and I think we ought to enter in with praise. And I see this very symbolically, and if you guys will sit through Genesis and through the rest of the Old Testament, you're going to see it often. Praise going before the battle. Praise going before the victory. You'll see it over and over again. God says, send Judah. Send Judah. You know, you think, poor Judah. One time they went out to fight the tribe of Benjamin. Terrible atrocity had happened in, in the nation Israel. A Levite had a concubine, and the Levite's concubine had been raped and ravaged and murdered by some Benjaminites. The Levite cut her up into 12 pieces, sent her to all the tribes of Israel and said, such a thing has not happened in the history of Israel. We've got to get together and deal with this. So what happens? All the tribes gathered together and they came against Benjamin and they inquired of the Lord, what should we do? And God said, send Judah. So there goes praise. And what happens to Judah? About 20, I think it was 22,000 of them died in the same day. 24,000 or 22,000. Between 22 and 24,000 of them died. So you say, well, why should I praise the Lord if I'm going to die doing it? The fact of the matter is, is God was still preparing victory through praise. And you're going to see this. You're going to see this over and over again as you study the Old Testament. Look up Judah and see how many times he went before the battle. See how many times God said, send him there and see what happens. So Judah went up to speak to Joseph. Joseph, in other words, was going to have to show him where they were going to go. They were going to point out the way to Goshen. And so they came to the land of Goshen. So Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. And can you imagine how he must have felt? He hasn't seen his daddy in 22 years. He presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. Israel said to Joseph, now let me die since I've seen your face because you're still alive. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I'll go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, My brothers and those of my father's house who were in the land of Canaan have come to me, and the men are shepherds, for their occupation has been to feed livestock, and they have brought their flocks, their herds, and all that they have. So it shall be when Pharaoh calls you and says, What is your occupation that you shall say, Your servant's occupation has been with livestock from our youth even till now, both we and also our fathers that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd's an abomination to the Egyptians. So he said, let them know what you do, and they'll give you the best of the land just to keep you from coming into contact with them. So that's what they're going to do. And they are shepherds. So Joseph went and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brothers, their flocks and their herds, and all that they possess have come from the land of Canaan, and indeed they're in the land of Goshen. And he took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? They said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. They said to Pharaoh, We have come to sojourn in the land because your servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now therefore, please, let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, saying, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Have your father and brothers dwell in the, in the best of the land. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen. And if you know any competent men among them, then make them chief herdsmen over my livestock, because none of the Egyptians wanted to take care of them. Then Joseph brought in his father Jacob and set him before Pharaoh. And this must have been an interesting meeting, because there is the most powerful monarch and this little old man face to face. The Egyptian king who is feeding the nation right now, Israel, as he feeds Jacob and his descendants. 
This man, this Pharaoh, was incredibly powerful. And you have to picture the contrast between him and all the dignity and power that Egypt had to offer. And I'm certain that Pharaoh was a heathen. He wasn't a believer in the one God. You'll see this later on. But you see this introduction. This is my dad, you know, Joseph saying that. And what does Jacob do? Jacob blessed Pharaoh. You see, the greater blesses the lesser. And just because Pharaoh had control of food didn't make Pharaoh great. Just because Pharaoh was a powerful man and was going to be more powerful in the future didn't make him great. What made this little old man great was he was blessed by God. And we can actually be blessings to those who the world holds up and says, but they're the most dignified, the most honorable. And little people like us can actually learn to be blessings to others and to bestow blessings from the Lord to people. Pharaoh said to Jacob, how old are you? Because he's an old man. But Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And they've not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. And that's true because we know that Abraham lived to be about 175 years old and Isaac lived to be 180. So he says, I'm only, a, I'm only a child. I'm only 130. So Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. And Joseph situated his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the, in the best of the land. And this portion of land is called the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. Then Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his brother's household with bread, according to no, the number in their families. Now, there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought. Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. So when the money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in your presence? The money's failed. In other words, we've given you all the money we have, and we're going to die. Joseph said, give your livestock, and I will give you bread for your livestock if the money's gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the cattle of the herds, and for the donkeys. Thus he fed them with bread in exchange for all their livestock that year. So he's got their money. He's getting their livestock. When that year had ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, we won't hide from, the, from my Lord, that our money is gone. My Lord also has our herds of livestock. There's nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants of Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. So they wanted to become indentured servants to to Pharaoh. What they're doing is turning over ownership of not only themselves, but their properties to him. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every man of the Egyptians sold his field because the famine was severe upon them. So the land became Pharaoh's. And as for the people, he moved them into the cities from one end of the borders of Egypt to the other end. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had rations allotted to them by Pharaoh. And they ate the rations which Pharaoh gave them Therefore, they did not sell their lands. And I think that in this verse, verse 22, it indicates that Pharaoh made a decision. You don't see Pharaoh making decisions as we're studying the word here. You've, you haven't noticed Pharaoh making a lot of decisions other than he commanded uh, Joseph to bring your family on down. But you don't see Pharaoh giving any orders. I believe what he did is he overruled Joseph. I don't think Joseph wanted the uh, Egyptian priesthood to retain their land and their food and stuff. I think he wanted them to be taxed like everybody else. But it doesn't appear that that's what Pharaoh wanted. Pharaoh said, no, we're going to leave their lands alone. And I think that, uh, that jo uh, Pharaoh overruled uh, Joseph in this. Joseph said to the people, indeed, I have bought you and your land this day for Pharaoh. Look, here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. And it shall come to pass in the harvest that you shall give one-fifth to Pharaoh. Four-fifths shall be your own as seed for the field and for your food, for those of your households, 
and as food for your little ones. And that is really a pretty fair offer for them because, you know, they, they, all they had, you know, they didn't, they, didn't, they didn't have an economy like us. You know, they were agricultural. All they needed was what they were growing, and four-fifths of what they had was plenty for them. And so Pharaoh was, uh, was going to get a, one, um, a 20% cut and everything, and it was going to continue to prosper the land of Egypt. So they said, you've saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it law over the land of Egypt to this day, which is the day of this writing of this book, not today, except for the land of the priests only, which didn't become Pharaoh's. So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen, and they, pos and they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the length of J Jacob's life was 147 years. When the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, Now if I have found favor in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt. But let me lie with my fathers, you shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you have said. Then he said, Swear to me. And he swore to him. So Israel bowed himself on the head of the bed, and that's in prayer of thanksgiving to God. Now it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father's sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob was told, Look, your son Joseph is coming to you, and Israel strengthened himself and sat up on the bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz, which is now Bethel, in the land of Canaan, and blessed me. And he said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make of you a multitude of people, and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. And we need to remember that, and this is an important thing for us to remember. God's agreement in his covenant was with the nation Israel to possess the land forever. And I really do understand the Jewish claim for, for what they call Palestine. You know, the word Palestine really is, its, its origin is from Philistines. The Jews don't like the name Palestine. I don't know if you realize that or not. Did you know that, that the Jews don't like Israel called Palestine? They don't like it because that's not its name. It's Israel. It's the nation Israel. And they will claim the land of Israel back all the way to the promises God made originally to their father Abraham. And so I believe that promise is still in effect. And I believe that God is still holding true to that promise. The nation Israel belongs to Israel. And so he says, now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. What he's doing is he's claiming Manasseh and Ephraim as being his direct descendants. Notice there's no tribe of Joseph. There's no tribe of Joseph. There's the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. So what he did is he claimed Manasseh and Ephraim as his sons. Joseph isn't part of the tribal system, and Manasseh and Ephraim are. So he said, they're mine, as Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Now I want to remind you that Reuben, being the firstborn, had lost the right of the blessing of the firstborn. And I want you to remember this because we're going to get into some blessings here in a second, and this has to lay the foundation for you. By going up to his father's bed and sleeping with one of his father's concubines, Reuben had forfeited his right to what is called primogenitor, being the firstborn with all the blessings. Now remember one thing. This is an important thing to know. Joseph should have been Jacob's firstborn. Had not Laban had not Laban given Leah in deceit to him that night, then Joseph would have been the firstborn. But because of the deception that was involved, Reuben became the firstborn. But Jacob does not treat 
Reuben as being firstborn. What he's done is he's really blessing Joseph, and he's blessing Joseph's descendants. Reuben isn't going to uh, receive the kind of blessing that he could have had. Why? Because he went up to his father's couch and defiled it, and he's going to say that. So what happens here is really the blessings that Reuben was supposed to have went on to Manasseh and Ephraim. He says, Your offspring whom you beget after them shall be yours and will be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. In other words, they'll be receiving an inheritance from the inheritance Manasseh and Ephraim have. But as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died beside me in the land of Canaan on the way when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath. And I, bur and I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. Then Israel saw Joseph's sons, and he said, who are these? Now, they're, Manasseh and Ephraim at this time are in their early 20s. And Joseph said to his father, They are my sons whom God has given me in this place. You see, he couldn't see them because his eyes weren't very, well, they were dimming. They were, he was going blind. So he said, Who are these? And Joseph said, They're my sons whom God has given me in this place. And he said, Please bring them to me and I will bless them. Now, the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. Then Joseph brought them near him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see your face, but in fact, God also has shown me your offspring. So Joseph brought them from beside his knees, and he bowed down with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. Then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. So what he's going to do here is he's going to give a blessing of a firstborn to the one who was born second. You'll see this in a second. But he knew what he was doing. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my father Fathers Abraham and Isaac walked. The God who has fed me all my life. Now that word fed is an interesting word. It literally means the God who has shepherded me all my life. All my life long to this day. The angel who has redeemed me from all evil. Bless the lads. Let my name be upon them. And the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. And let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. He gave them the blessing of the firstborn. Now, when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to, to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He shall become a people. And he also shall be great, but truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. Now this has happened before, where God has blessed the uh, secondborn over the first. God blessed Isaac over Ishmael. We know that God blessed Jacob over Esau. And we know that Joseph was receiving a blessing over his brother Reuben. And now we see that this is happening with Joseph's sons. So he blessed them that day and said, By you Israel will bless, saying, May God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And thus he said Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am dying, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my, and my bow. He was giving him a portion of land that he had won, he had conquered from an Amorite. Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Now he's going to give his blessings. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my right hand and the beginning of my strength. In other words, you were at one time my pride and joy. You're my firstborn. You're the strength from me, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, you shall not excel. Because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. 
So Jacob never forgot what he had done in shaming his, shaming his father, and because of that, he didn't bless him. One of the interesting things about the tribe of Reuben is when they finally had an opportunity to enter into the promised land, they didn't cross the Jordan. They remained on the other side. And they never even crossed over. And that's why he says, you're unstable as water. He says, Simeon and Levi, and he ties these brothers together because they, they were obviously very close. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitation. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly, for in their anger they slew a man, in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it's fierce, their wrath, for it's cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. He split the tribes of Simeon and Levi. The Levites became the priestly tribe. Um, he's remembering what they did when they went into Shechem and wiped out. They wiped out all those people who had defiled Dinah. They killed all the men. And he's remembering what they had done. And he said, your anger is cruel and it is fierce. So what he did is he split the tribes and they were divided. They uh, settled in different areas. As a matter of fact, the Levites never had a possession of land uh, that they would call their own, but they lived off of the gifts of the, of the rest of the tribes of Israel. He says, Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Now, when he was given this prophecy, he's speaking of Messiah. Judah is the tribe Jesus came from. And he calls him a lion's whelp. Judah, Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. And that was a prophetic utterance in reflection of what Jesus is going to be. What he is going to be is the lion from the tribe of Judah. And he's prophesying. He said, uh, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. The word Shiloh has the same root as shalom, and it means peace. And, and basically what it means is the one who brings peace. And it was a prophecy of Messiah who was going to come and establish an everlasting kingdom and come from the tribe of Judah. Now, this did not begin to really firm up and begin to take effect until David, the king who was from the tribe of Judah, began to rule. And then at that point, Jesus, being a descendant from King David, now is ruling an everlasting kingdom. Zebulun shall dwell by the haven of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships, and his border shall adjoin Sidon. So the tribe of Zebulun had land up in the northern uh, north western border of Israel, up there by Tyre and Sidon, up by Phoenicia. Issachar is a strong donkey. <laughs> I don't think I'd like to be called that, you know. You're a strong donkey, lying down between two burdens. In other words, he's a big, strong, it's going to be a strong tribe that is lazy. Issachar is a strong donkey lying down between two burdens. He saw that rest was good and the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden and became a band of slaves. They never amount to anything in the history of Israel. Dan shall judge his people. As one of the tribes of Israel, Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider shall fall backward. I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. Dan uh, was a powerful tribe. It was a small tribe, but it was a powerful tribe. But it's interesting in verse 17 when he says, it shall be a serpent by the way. There's a double reference there. It can mean that it was a powerful tribe. But that word serpent is interesting because many times it is, it is uh, associated with Satan. Dan is a tribe that brought Israel into idolatry. And it appears that this is a prophecy of something like that because he said they shall be a serpent by the way and a viper to the path. Gad, a troop shall tramp upon him, but he shall triumph at last. Bread from Asher shall be rich, and he shall yield royal dainties. 
And, and the, the tribe of Asher was a, a very, they lived what you would call a real good life, and they never really took all the land that God had promised them. Naphtali is a deer let loose. He gives goodly words. And uh, the tribe was known for its swiftness in battle. And uh, also there was an individual by the name of Barak who, uh, who was involved in, uh, in the book of Judges with, uh, uh, what is that judge's name? It was a lady, Deborah. Deborah. Deborah and Barak uh, were involved in destroying a king by the name, or a, a commander by the name of Sisera. And after Sisera had gotten defeated, Barak wrote a song with Deborah. And uh, that's what's referenced here when it says he gives goodly words. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him, but his bow remained in strength. And the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. By the God of your Father who will help you, and by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the teeth that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, the blessings of your Father, have excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brother. So he gives to him the blessing of the firstborn. <coughs> Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. And Benjamin was, once again, I mentioned to you earlier the, the, the account in Judges 20 where Benjamin ravaged, the tribe of Benjamin ravaged this one woman. They were almost destroyed by, by the, the rest of the tribes. They were almost wiped out completely for that sin. Uh, and you see that they were ravenous wolves. Now, all, of, all these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is what their father spoke to them. And he blessed them. He blessed each one according to his own blessing. Then he charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite as a possession for a burial place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is there were purchased from the sons of Heth. And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet, he drew his feet up into the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. And he died at the age of 147. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for him, for such are the days required for those who are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him seventy days. And when the days of his mourning were passed, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, if now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the hearing of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Behold, I'm dying. In my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan, there you shall bury me. Now, therefore, please, let me go up and bury my father, and I will come back. Pharaoh said, Go up and bury your father, as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the house of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's house. Only their little ones, their flocks, and their herds they left in the land of Goshen. There went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great gathering. Then they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, and they mourned there with a great and very solemn lamentation. He observed seven days of mourning for his father." When the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the morning at the threshing floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous morning of the Egyptians. Because there were so many Egyptians there, they figured that the guy who was being buried was an Egyptian. Therefore, its name was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond the Jordan. It means the morning of Egypt. So his sons did for him just as he had commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite as property for a burial place. And after he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers, and all who went up with him to bury his father. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us 
and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. Do you see how that is? You see how our consciences work. I mean, he's already received forgiveness. They've been together for, uh, for quite a few years now, and yet they're still thinking Joseph's just been waiting for dad to die so he could do us a number. That's what, that's what happens. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Hey, I think that's interesting. It's an interesting thought. He had already forgiven them years ago. I wonder, I wonder if it grieves the Lord when we continue to ask him to forgive us for sins he's already forgiven us for. I wonder if we, should, if we should begin to live in the victory that God gives to us and the freedom that he gives to us rather than asking him constantly to forgive us for sins he's already forgiven us for. I wonder how God reacts to that. That's an interesting thought. We see Joseph, what he did is he wept. When is it going to become apparent to you that you're forgiven, is what he's saying. You're forgiven. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we're your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In the book of Romans, of course, you wouldn't have known this is going to be written, but we're told that everything works for the good of those who love God, those who are the called according to his purpose. What is the good that he's referring to? He's referring to the fact that the things that we go through are going to bring us into what is called the conformity of the image of Jesus Christ. The things that you go through, the things that you're being pressed in, bring you to a deeper awareness of Christ. And Joseph is telling these people, you meant it for evil. Your intentions were evil, but God's were for good. He said, God meant it for good. Why? In order that I might bring it about, or in order that he might bring it about, that many people would be saved. Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation. The children of Mature, the son of Manasseh, were also brought up on Joseph's knees. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And in faith he prophesied that his body would not remain in rest in Egypt. And later on we see in the book of Exodus how that they remembered that statement, and when they moved out of the bondage that they're going to find themselves in as we study Exodus, they remembered Joseph, and they took his bones out, and they took him out into the promised land. The book of Hebrews reminds us in chapter 11, verse 22, that Joseph had made this statement and that it was fulfilled. Joseph was speaking over 400 years in advance, though, because it was going to be over 400 years uh, in bondage. You know, the people were going to find themselves in bondage. The first, you know, I'm certain, great period of time, they were having good, good old times. But then, as we get into Exodus, a Pharaoh arose who knew not Joseph and didn't honor Joseph and enslaved the children of Israel. And at that time, 400 years later, from this prophecy, at that time, God delivers the nation Israel. And we'll see that as we get into Exodus.